Hey everybody, it's Uncle John from Your Story Hour, and I'm back to bring you another chapter from Eeny Meeny Miney Mo and Still Mo by the author Sam Campbell. Today's chapter is number 19, and it's entitled Trails and Tales. To the west of our island, beyond a narrow stretch of water, we look upon a fine forest. Across its groves of pine and hard woods come the glory of Northland sunsets. There we find an abundance of the treasures the Norse woods have to offer. There are mossy glens, tree-covered hills, life-filled swamps and carpets of ferns and wild flowers. Deer, bear, wildcat, lynx, coyote, wolf, beaver, otter, animals native to this country are still there in sufficient numbers to be seen occasionally. Into this region we have threaded many trails for our convenience. They lead over chosen routes to selected spots. One circles through hemlock colonnades, skirts a swamp that in spring is filled with wild iris blossoms, and climbs to a hilltop from which our lake can be seen. Another threads its way over birch-crested ridges and reaches vanishing lakes where dainty orchids bloom in July. Yet another reaches into far-flung bogs through which is a deer, great deer runway. Lesser trails take off from main ones leading to sequestered points that have caught our fancy for some reason or another. It was into this network of trails that Duke went daily. Sometimes he was gone from dawn till dark, sometimes for only a few hours. Two appointments were definite, early morning for breakfast, early evening for dinner. In a little pack sack, he carried with him bird glasses, a lunch prepared by Jenny, a notebook, a compass, and certain chosen books rich in thought. And there was one more item very vital for that season of the year, a bottle of savory liquid which, when rubbed on hands and face, caused the mosquitoes to stay away. For at that season these little dive-bombing pests are numerous and savage. With this equipment, Duke was ready to make use of his hours in the forest. Sometimes he traveled far, coming home with a peculiar tiredness that is laden with blessing and is a kind of rest in itself. Sometimes he sought a comfortable spot, a moss-covered rock, a cushioned log, to sit, think, read, and let the world flow by him. His decisions were by impulse and whim, not by any strict plan. One morning he had thought to go to Vanishing Lake and explore its interesting shores, but a heron flew by and carried his thoughts in another direction. So he went on a new course. If he had thought to go where he could watch the red fox den on a distant hillside, and then decided later that he would rather take a swim, he took a swim. There were no orders, no military rules and regulations. We had said that he was to do as he pleased, and he certainly did a masterly job of it. Seventeen days he was to have, and he declared he wanted to make an eternity of it. But I learned quickly that I was to have a definite place in Duke's routine. When I heard him land at the boathouse with his boat or canoe, returning from some forest experience, I pushed my work back and waited. I knew what was coming. Almost anything might be placed before me for identification or, ide or explanation. Sometimes he brought in little objects, a cocoon, a twig, a leaf, a feather, a flower, a stone. Other times he had just made notes or drawings of something that had engaged his attention. I saw the funniest looking little critter today, Duke said on his return from one journey. No sense in wasting fur on anything like him. He wasn't so large as a mouse, sort of brown on the back and gray beneath, seemed to have no eyes or ears and a nose that looked as if it had been sharpened on a grindstone. There wasn't enough of him to be a mole, or he'd have been one. Where did you see him? On the sunny side of a hill back in the hardwood country. I almost stepped on him, and boy did he dive into a hole under an old stump. Then Duke would sit and take notes on the explanation. This time it was a shrew he had found, one of the tiny little fellows that are somewhat robbed of their identity by most nature lovers. Many who see them about their wide range, all over the north and central part of the continent, call them moles or little mice, but they constitute a family all their own. It is easy to distinguish them. First there is their size. They are so small. The common ones about four inches long, and an inch and a half of that is tail. 
Their little front feet are like those of mice, though in no way similar to the pad-like forepaws of a mole. Their sharp noses and eyes and ears that are well hidden give them, a give them an appearance not like any other creature. They do not burrow, but sometimes enter the subterranean runways of moles or the tunnels of other animals. Their food consists of any kind of meat they can get. Due to their diminutive size, they prey on only bugs, grubs, worms, and the like. They are pugnacious little fellows, and fights they have with anything near their size usually results in victories for them. They have learned the trick of making themselves undesirable as a meal for most predators. Certain species of them have glands, usually on the sides of their body, which emit a noxious odor when the animal is frightened or enraged. Due to this, most creatures of the forest are satisfied to leave them alone. All right, said Duke, finishing his notes. Now I know what a shrew is. I used to think a shrew was just a wife that gets beaten up in one of Shakespeare's plays. Now, what is this? He placed before me a little green plant with wide, thick, glossy leaves. Break one of the leaves and smell it or taste it. I think you will know, Duke, I said. He did and contemplated the odor thoughtfully. Wintergreen, he asked. I nodded. And another thing, Duke continued. He was filled with questions that day. I saw a nest high in a tree, and when I examined it, I thought I saw a snake that was up there hanging over the side. I thought maybe there was trouble, so I climbed up to it. There I found a newly built nest with a piece of snakeskin woven in and hanging down. Now what about that? The nest of the crested flycatcher, Duke. It's a common trick of this peculiar little bird. We can only guess why he does it, but it seems certain he selects the snakeskin for some reason other than to get nesting material. It is entirely possible he does it to keep certain enemies away. Blue jays, crows, squirrels, or chipmunks. Now Jenny was calling that dinner was ready, and as usual, we were ready for dinner. But Duke had another observation of the day which must be talked about. I landed with the canoe on Sunset Point, he said, indicating a point of land which reached well out toward our island. There, on a low limb of an old oak, was a red squirrel that was quite small. When I saw it, I, find myself, I found myself calling it Mo. I don't know why, but it looked like Mo. Certainly it acted like the lazy old rascal. It just hovered close to that limb and looked down at me, blinking the way Mo used to do. Do you suppose it could be the little guy? I shook my head. Not a chance in a thousand, I would think, Duke. And yet, I wouldn't want to say absolutely no. We really know so little about animals. It's my guess. We have seen all we shall ever see of those squints who have disappeared. Well, how could I know for sure, Duke persisted, while Jenny kept calling that dinner was very ready. I thought a minute. Peanuts would prove it, I said. No wild squirrel in this region knows what peanuts are. Place a peanut before one of those little fellows out in the woods and he pays no attention to it. Try our little discovery with peanuts. You will know by his reactions if it is one of our red squirrel gang. Okay, we do that tomorrow, said Duke. Now there is something else here, and he began fishing around in his pack sack for another object he had brought. But Jenny was tired of waiting. She did not call dinner again. Instead, she walked past us carrying a steaming platter of boiled ham. Broiled ham, and Duke and I followed to the table as if we had been caught by hooks. And that's the end of that chapter. Come back tomorrow, and Aunt Nikki will have chapter number 20, which is called More About Mo. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.